I'm on this little kick. I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it, but I'm on this kick. It just keeps coming back to me about taking all of these things that we we put so much value in and God doesn't. We raise them up and we put so much value in them, but God doesn't. Do we think we know something He doesn't? Do we think we have a better way? Do we think we're smarter than He is? I don't know. Things like, have you ever done a Bible study on the things that our Christian world today makes so important? Just name something that the Christian world makes really important today. What? Nice buildings. Have you ever done a Bible study on nice buildings? Happiness. Ever done a Bible study on happiness? Safety. Ever done a Bible study on safety? Balance. How many of you ever balance? Ever done a Bible study on balance? <laughs> All of these things that the Christian psycho babble people quote and talk about. It's middle it's Eastern philosophy that's creeped in to religion and creeped into Christian churches. One of the ones that I I jump up and down on so hard because it's so radical. And what's amazing to me, it's radical for today. But it's not in the scriptures, and it's amazing to me how people who apply the the this one particular principle they apply it to their lives. They never judge their fruit, and when they do judge their fruit, they judge it from the world's perspective, not God's perspective. And that's the doctrine of family in the church today. Um, it doesn't. The doctrine, and it's truly a doctrine of family today. I mean, it's got to be a doctrine. We name churches after it. I mean, we no longer have churches that worship God. We have churches that worship family. We have first churches that worship life. Not, not God's life for people, but the life experience of the congregation. Um, the, the doctrine of family is amazing. Have you ever done a Bible study on family? Have you ever... Have you ever put family in its proper perspective in your life and how the Bible says to do it? Have you ever did a real, like, read every passage that talks about children? Have you ever read every passage that talks about children in the Bible? Anybody, raise your hand. It's real easy. Just me, Dan, and Angie. I don't know about all of them. It's real easy. You just do a Bible. You do. You go to an internet website. There's a lot of young people here. Very few older people today. You go to the internet website and you you go to like BibleGateway.com and you do a keyword search. Type in children, kids, offspring. When you read those. That is what the Bible says about raising children. It's amazing it has nothing to do with what we do today. The doctrine of children and family of the church is scary. Do you know that in most churches, people that are age 25 to 35 are useless in the church? Of, in the church? Why? Because they're busy raising their children. Except there's no place in Scripture that talks about people that were called by God stopping so they could raise their children. As a matter of fact, uh, one of my wife's favorite quotes is uh, when the, God called this one disciple and he said, well, my mom and dad are sick and, and they're old and I, I'm not ready because I, I want to be here while they, so that you know, I can see them to death. And then be here to help them, and you know. And Christ looked at him and said, "Let the dead bury the dead." What would happen if every time you used the, your excuse to not do what God called you to do? What would happen if every time that excuse came up in your mind, you said, "Let the dead bury the dead." That's the core of today's sermon is God is bigger than everything. 
Let me see your scars. Let me see your wounds. Let me see your hurts and your pains. Come on, let's see them. Because God's bigger than that. Well, you don't know. I don't care. I don't care how bad it is. Show it to us. Let's see it. What, what circumstance on this earth matters more than God? What circumstance in your life is so big, so powerful, so damaging that God can't do what He said He's going to do in your life? Tell me what it is. Quickly. You can't. So today, I'm going to systematically challenge your thinking. What, what happens... We're, what were we doing the other day? We said something. Evan was talking about... We were hanging out with a bunch of of young men at the church, at my house on Friday being uh, goofy and dorky and uh, being ornery men and um, it was just funny and I said freedom of Christ is fun it doesn't give you freedom to be nasty and horrible person but it's fun you can look at yourself and say yeah that's something I gotta work on instead of You'll find that out today too. How many of you guys have something that you're scared that your Christian friends might find out about you and that you're frightened, uh, a deep dark secret of sin that, or, or hurt and pain that something's happened to you? How many of you have something like that and you're afraid people are going to find out? Whether it's a sin, maybe you like to uh, smoke, maybe you like to, maybe you've been molested, maybe, maybe, and you don't want Christian people or your Christian friends to find out. Raise your hand. Everybody raise your hand. You're like, well, I don't have any sins. Yeah, do you talk bad about your friends? Yeah. Do you have a negative? Do you have a negative attitude all the time? Yeah. Okay. Well, listen. Let's throw them on the wall and look at them. Let's throw those horrible things, those scars, those wounds, those stu- moments of stupidity, moments of that bring absolute shame. Throw them on the wall. Let's look at them. Let's let's throw them on the big screen and everybody go. Ew! Can we do that? You're like, well, what would be the purpose to prove to you? That it doesn't matter. One of the doctrines of raising children that we have in the Church of America today that's a false doctrine is that um, failure for children is evil. That your child feeling like a failure and failing at things is horrible. And that so now we have. I don't think it was meant to do this, but we have good, good non-Christians and good Christian people running around putting bumpers around their children's lives so that their children do not fail and screw up. And, and, so, and what you end up making is a, a, a human being that cannot control themselves because they never had to. You know, how many of you guys realize one of the ways to train your children not to take that bottle of poison out from underneath the sink and drink it is to set it in front of them. The best way to train your child not to drink the bottle of poison under your sink is to put your child in a room and set the bottle of poison in front of them. And then train them not to touch it. Well, how do you train them not to touch it? Train them just like you train anything. No. They, they reach for it. Don't touch. You, know, you don't have to do anything mean to them. You just, it's training. Removing them or putting latches on your cupboards is not how you train your children. That's how you make them stupid. <laughs> what you're saying is someone is always going to be in your life to remove the hazards from your life. I'm not going to train you to be smart enough to know things that are, there are things out there that are wrong for you. I'm going to protect you all your life. And so when you get older and I can't protect you anymore... Good luck. I could. Could you imagine Christ walking into a a really wonderful Christian family and and seeing locks on all the cabinets and and him going? I, I'm convinced Christ would look at you and say, 
I thought you loved your children. I do. That's why I'm protecting them. You don't love your children by protecting them. You love them by teaching them to overcome. Let's throw all of your mistakes on the wall. There's something really, really powerful about a child screwing up and a father or a mother scolding them. Even maybe even disciplining them or punishing them regarding of how much the screw up is. And that child knowing that even though I screwed up, dad loves me. Because at the end of the whooping or at the end of the discipline, my mom or my dad hugs me and I now know that I can screw up there will be consequences, but their love never changes. That's what we don't have in most families. We have ladies who are raising children by themselves. The majority of children that come to our Saturday night program is they're raised by women by themselves or with the third or fourth boyfriend their mom has had since they've been born. And the, the discipline is not love. As a matter of fact, they discipline them from emotion. There's nothing, folks, I think a child would be better off beaten with a belt than emotionally disciplined. You're like, what do you mean? Um, I was whooped with a belt from my wonderful father because I was bad. He didn't beat me like a drunken person. He whooped me because I was bad. He, it was like, here's how it went. It was, son, it was like, you know, if we, my brother and I screwed up while dad was at work, mom would say, you're going to get it. <laughs> and that was worse because you knew like four hours later dad was coming home and it was on, you know. And so he would say, son, go back into my bedroom. And he, I would go back there and wait. And he would come back, and on the way down the hall, he would go. <laughs> and he wouldn't come in with this anger, of, I'm going to kill you. No, he'd come and say, Son, what did you do? And I'd say, Well, Mom says I did this. And <laughs> Tom. And I learned quickly that it was much better to just own it. Because the pain and suffering would be much less if I just owned it. and Because uh, he would, if he, if he needed to, he'd get angry. And uh, there's nothing more wonderful than a father being angry with his child in discipline in a loving way. Uh, did you know that all anger is not wrong? Did you know that anger is not evil? Did you know that anger is actually a godly emotion? Just like all things the devil has done, the devil has corrupted the things of God in his perfect way. Shouldn't we get angry when we see injustice? We actually now have a generation of people when they see someone being uh, abused, they don't do anything. We actually have to run public announcements uh, advertisement. Our government now spends millions of dollars running advertisements to, to encourage people to stand up to mean people. Why? Because we've been taught that being angry about a mean person is wrong. My dad used to say where he lived, if they, had a, if they knew a man who was beating his wife, the good, godly, righteous men filled with anger would go fix it. This was way back before we let the government control our discipline. What do you mean they'd go fix it? They would righteously in anger fix the problem. They wouldn't kill him, but he would know. Have you ever met those old farmer guys? Yes. That you know... I don't want to do him wrong. He won't kill me. He won't be mean. He won't go above and beyond what I deserve. But he's going to give me exactly what I deserve. That's righteous anger. Righteous anger. How many of you guys have been taught that anger, all by, anger is evil? How many of you guys have been taught that anger is evil? Yeah, isn't that amazing? That would mean God's evil. <clears throat> If 
It reminds me yesterday, Kat was there, we were standing out in the, in the uh, road, and on a county road, so there's nobody coming, and you know, we're standing there talking, and there's this guy, and he has his little two-year-old, and he's my neighbor, and his little two-year-old sitting there, and there's a car coming about a half mile down the road, and his two-year-old decides she's going to play fit game and she starts throwing a fit a little bit of a fit and he knows that that means she thinks she can just run and throw a fit and do what she wants except there's a car coming it was just so funny because you could see the switch in his brain it immediately went from I love you sweetie to uh, I'm going to be angry with you for a moment to protect you from dying and he just grabbed her arm and said come here it was a switch. It was a good, righteous anger that saved her life. Because otherwise, you've never seen two-year-olds throw a fit. Debbie, you saw one last night, right, when Nate threw a fit? Anyways, uh, <laughs> it's a joke. But if you ever seen a two-year-old throw a fit, Debbie didn't get it. She's like, what? If you ever see two-year-olds throw a fit, she, um, they, they, they lose track of who's around and what's going on, and all they care about is they're mad because they didn't get what they wanted. And she could have been running around in the, in the road as she got ran over by a car. The doctrines of the world are scary. We've raised our emotional experiences higher than the truth of God. We now put more value upon our experiences than we do on what God says. I want to challenge you today to think that you don't even believe in God anymore. How could you put your experiences in the presence of God as value or equal to God? How could you do that? 2 Kings chapter 17, 37, and 39 says, You must always be careful to keep the decrees and regulations, the laws and commands he wrote for you. Do not worship other gods, including your emotions, feelings, and circumstances. Do not forget the covenant I have made with you, and do not worship other gods. Rather, worship the Lord your God. It is he who will deliver you from the hand of your emotions, experiences, and circumstances. This says enemies. Bigger than God. We're constantly holding up things to God. Things that we can see and feel that are in conflict to what God says. He says you are free. We focus on the things we need done for us to be free. God says you are free. We say not yet. Why do we say not yet? Because of what we're experiencing. Because of what we see. And because of what I'm experiencing and what I see, I now de determine God's decrees as false and mine as truth. How can you say you worship God? John 8, 35 and 36 says, Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Galatians 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, which was a form of keeping the law, that Christ will be of no value to you at all. In other words, he's saying if you begin to place value in these things of the law, you're raising up the things of religion in the presence of God. You're placing value upon things of religion, things of right thinking. You're placing value upon those. How can you place value upon something of religion while you're in the presence of God himself? God has set you free from worrying about the things of religion. Now you could be with him. Why are you still focused on the things of the religion? 
Some of you are like, well, does that mean I can do whatever I want? Uh, if you're focused on God, you'll only do what He wants. If you're using God, you will go to Him, suck up to Him, so you feel good about yourself, and then go out and do what you want. There will be no one in heaven using God. Trust me. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to, to everyone, every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You are trying to be justified by the law, have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace, for through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith and righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value at all. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You are running a good race. Who cut it? Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. He says, I am confident in the Lord that you will not, that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, he says, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. <laughs> That's hilarious right there. For, for those of you who think I am improper in the church, did you just hear what Paul wrote there? Paul said, those of, those of you, that, those people that are in your body of believers that are trying to get everybody to focus on all the things they're not doing right and all the things they are doing right, he said, you know, if they want to practice the law, I wish they'd go ahead and circumcise themselves. Now, do you guys know what circumcision is? <laughs> Circumcision is cutting off the male foreskin of the penis. <laughs> yeah, I did. I said it. <laughs> and what Paul said is, as for those of you that are in the church and you're trying to get people to focus on all the things they don't do and they do do, I wish you'd just go all the way and cut off your penis. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> So you're like, it is, it's, it's right there. You know, the Bible does talk about sex change. I, and I guess if we could take it from here, the Bible says that those of you that are sex changing yourselves are bound by the law. Okay, so unless you practice all the law, you're going to hell. Anyways. Um, <laughs> that, was your, that was your word of com comedic enjoyment today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I couldn't resist. Bigger than God. We are constantly holding up things to God we can see and feel that are in conflict to what God says. The second thing is, he says his peace and love will surpass our understanding. Well, hold on a second. We've got to wait for these guys to be done with that joke. Let us know when you're done. It's not bigger than God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That's right. For those of you men in the room that are worshiping that appendage, it isn't bigger than God. Take it captive and submit it to God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, really? They went there. Hey, every man in the room knows the, the battle that I'm talking of. Submit it to God. It's not about how you feel. Submit it to God. Things that are bigger than God. He says his peace and love will surpass our understanding. We ask God to convince us. We keep bringing him knowledge we have that contradicts what he promises. He says, dwell upon these things and my peace will surpass your understanding. And we say, yeah, but what about this thought I had last night? And what about that thought I had last night? And what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And what about that? Wow. You ever seen a dog chase his tail? 
That's what you're doing. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 and 19. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the, all the fullness of God. Or Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, that surpasses, goes beyond, makes your understanding seem silly. The peace of God that makes your understanding. Now, what, anybody know what your understanding is? Your understanding encompasses your thoughts, feelings, and emotions. The peace of God, which transcends your th thoughts, feelings, and emotions, oh, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So when we sit there and we say, His peace and love will surpass our understanding, we ask God to convince us. We keep bringing Him things that we are experiencing and challenging the truth of the Word of God. And the last thing is, He wishes to usher us into the kingdom upon His earth. He wishes for us to be in His kingdom and declaring it. And what do we say? We go to Him with our problems instead of seeking His plans. We keep looking at our scars. It's a scar because He healed it so you could go on. Not so you could continue living in it forever. Some of you, oh, this is going to hurt. Listen carefully. And the person who thinks this isn't for you, it is. Some of you, you've had great scars in your life. Great wounds. And at the time of that wound and hurt, it was the only time people really loved you and accepted you. And psychologically, your mind loves that place. It loves it. You've raised your scar in the presence of God. He's already healed. Move on. If you do not submit it and focus on Christ instead of your experience and your hurt and your pain and the things that have happened to you, you will be robbed from all that He has for you. What you have today is all you get. Have you ever met people who are aging, 70s, 80s, and all they talk about is the past hurts and how people love them? Really? So when you're 70 and 80, God doesn't have anything for you? God doesn't have a work for you to do? God sets you free. It's a scar so that you can say, God healed me and now I can do anything. It's not a scar so you can say, yeah, oh. One of my favorite things to say is, would you like a cookie? Yes. People are like, oh. you ever see those? You ever see people? They start talking about their past hurts. They just get all excited inside. You can tell. You ever, you ever see? I'm not trying to be mean, folks, but we do it all. We, we, this is a person who values the pain and suffering 
and the affection they've gained from that pain and suffering more than they value what God is doing in their life. You're like. When Christ came back, did he ask for everybody's pity? Did he sit there and go, oh, it was just so hard up there on the cross? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, the only reason he showed them his wounds because they didn't believe that it was him. He didn't show it to them so they could endear affection and, and pity and sympathy. <coughs> My wife and I talk about this all the time. Those of you that think you are um, <laughs> coming along the side of my wife and feeling sorry for her, you're just pissing her off. You're not feeling sorry for her. You're letting her know that you are far from God. What do you mean? What do you think Christ would have done to Peter if he went, Oh, oh Christ, are you okay? I was so worried about you in that tomb. Oh, and how did it feel? Oh, are you going to be okay? I, you know, I just want you to... Know. I mean, Really? Really? I mean, He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He stands victorious in front of you. He doesn't need your sympathy. He needs your encouragement. He needs your affection and love and power of who God is. And you're like, well, Pastor Mike, then why do people do that? It's a need. No, no, it's a sin. It's not a need. What do you mean it's a sin? Are you saying our need for affection and, and empathy is a sin? No, I'm saying the person who puts value in that more than they put in God is sinning. Don't all shout at once. Amen. I get the opportunity to minister to young men and women who are looking for, for spouses. And so I constantly... I'm helping young people find out what kind of character is behind someone they're interested in. And you have to constantly challenge your motives and your heart. And the person who says, my heart is wicked and I cannot trust it. I don't make decisions based on how I feel. I make them based on the knowledge of God and His Word and truth. First of all, I'm not sure I've found anybody like that. It's really hard to be like that. Second of all, we, uh, we tend to fall in love before we judge character. Why? Because we put our sinful desires above truth. And then we try to make our sin fit into God's truth. And then you spend the rest of your life living, learning what grace is. <laughs> and having to give it. God wishes to usher in His kingdom upon this earth through you and me. And we go to Him with our problems instead of seeking His plans and proclaiming His truth and His will. Luke chapter 11, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When He finished, one of His disciples said to Him, Lord, teach us to pray, John is, just as John taught His disciples. He said to them, when you pray say, followed, how, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sinned against us, and lead us not in tem into temptation. Where in this does it talk about you knowing what you need and asking him for it? That would be the 
Yeah. Forgive us our sins and give us our daily bread. What are we supposed to be asking him for? Grace food. Your kingdom come. Thank you for letting, letting me experience it. Yep. John 14, 11 and 13. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Who is this? Christ. And he says, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you... Oh, oh. Okay, listen. There are people sitting in this room today. As I read that, you got bitter because you don't think you're ready. You're waiting for God to do something. You're still putting your experience, your understanding, your feelings, and saying God can't bring his kingdom come in my life until this happens. And God's going to hold out on you. Because you're still exalting your understanding, experiences, and feelings above Him. You know what you should be doing. But when you pray, you don't pray His kingdom come. You think you know what needs to happen before His kingdom can come. So, you pray that. Instead of, God, use me to declare your kingdom. Do you not think he knows what you need and he'll give it to you? <clears throat> Pastor Mike, I've been taught that we should go to God and make our supplication known to God. Folks, uh, going to God and asking him for things is not wrong. Withholding your obedience until he gives it to you is rebellion. Here's my little illustration for the day. The work of sin, lost, no direction or future, or hopelessness, weakness, psychological damage, emotional torment, bondage that cripples, prevails. Pretty exciting, isn't it? Yeah. The work of Christ, a purposed future, hope, strength made perfect in our weakness. That's the best one, by the way. Strength is made perfect when we suck. When we can say, I suck. Now, folks, take that into perspective. How many of you would like to throw your mud up on the wall? If your strength's made work, uh, perfect in weakness, throw your weakness up on the wall. Let's see it. Don't all get, raise your hand and ask to share. <laughs> Kaylee's like, I'll be perfect. I'll be perfect. Here's my stuff. You want to hear about it? <laughs> Restoration, setting the captives free, healing the brokenhearted. These are the works of Christ. This is where we're supposed to be living. And this is what we do. How many of you guys have ever done that? How many have ever done that? Just go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And, backwards and, forwards and, backwards and, forwards and you just and the Bible says a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. He should expect nothing from the Lord. Thank you. I wish I was that skinny. Anyways. What is it that I make bigger than God? I make my knowledge. I make my understanding of the circumstances bigger than God. Don't I? I make my feelings bigger than God. 
I make my wounds and my scars bigger than God. I make my twisted idea of what I believe bigger than God. I can't just... Folks, do you know how simple it is to serve God? Some of the simplest minded people in all the world have been used in unbelievably mighty ways to transform the world to advance God's kingdom. You don't have to be a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon. It's hard to do, but it's not complicated. When I pray, what am I seeing? What am I proclaiming? What am I asking for? God says, I am free. Why do I feel like I'm in bondage? God says his peace and love will surpass my understanding. So why do I need convinced? God says his kingdom will come. And we are asking for things he's already given us. Instead of the things he wishes to bring in and through our lives. The most powerful prayer you could ever pray is, Yes, Lord, do it. You were made to serve God with all your heart. Anything else will leave you lacking. I don't care if it's that special guy. I don't care if it's a special woman. I don't care if it's a mixture of the two. God is the only thing that's going to fulfill you. Anything else is going to leave you lacking. I don't care if it's that special place to live. I don't care if it's having children. I don't care if it's having a certain job. Everything else is going to leave you lacking. God is the only thing that will fulfill you. <clears throat> One of the things that God's taught me recently is don't worry about trying to convince people who don't know that. There's not a whole lot I'm ever going to say that's going to convince them. I can proclaim it and people who know it and needed to hear somebody proclaim it will come and join. But I'm not going to convince anybody. How am I going to convince you, Dan, that God's bigger than how you feel? If I try, you're just going to hate me. That's right. So why would I? We were made to enter in, to usher into God's kingdom. Instead, we get stuck in stuff he has already set us free from. <laughs> what would happen if you got focused on what God had for you and you just ran after it with all your heart? So just as I said that, through, in your mind, you started going through all these things that could be a problem. Who cares? See, the beautiful part about it is God is you. God becomes strong when you are weak. So all the problems will, will be places where God's strong. Isn't that exciting? List your problems. Let's put them on the wall. We'll see them. How can those be bigger than God? Give me all the things and reasons why you can't serve God. Go ahead. Do it. Those are your sins. People don't understand. I tell people all the time. I tell people all the time. Sins of the heart are way more dangerous than sins of the flesh. Way more dangerous. A sin of the heart is, this is why I can't serve God. You can list all the sins that you, I smoke, I drink. I talk trash about people, you know, I look at porn, I do this, I do that. It doesn't matter what it is. Just list them. I slept with my girlfriend last night. It doesn't matter. Just list them. The real sin is that you're listing something 
not what you listed. Amen. The real sin is that you think there's something bigger than God. <coughs> Get it? Got it. Good. We must focus on His promises and not our experiences and circumstances. Or we will place ourselves in bondage as we worship ourselves. We'll sing songs like, I am a friend of God. Who am I worshiping? My experience. Remember, nothing is bigger than God. He says, I am free. Let's, let's play this little uh, propaganda game. Ready? I want you to say it with me. I am free. Ready? I am free. Let's try it again. I am free. Everybody say, he says, I am free. He says, I am free. Second one. He says, his peace and love will surpass my understanding. He will usher in his kingdom upon this earth through me. That's right, because I'm awesome. Oh, wait, wait. Through us. Yeah. Yeah, no. Now you believe everything I say. I have hypnotized you through the rhythm of my words. <laughs> Folks, here's the thing. I don't care what your scars are. You need to throw them on the wall. Do you know why? So you can put them in their proper place. <coughs> Throw them up there. They probably won't stick, and they'll probably fall at the bottom of that wall like a pile of poop. That's exactly what your excuses are, or your reasons, or your scars, whatever you like to call them, they're still excuses. God is bigger than them. If he's not, he's not your God. How many in this room would like to say you're a Christian? Get your scars out and show them. Well, you know, I might lose my friends. They weren't your friends. They're with your friends. The Bible tells us that we overcome the enemy and the accuser by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. <laughs> we over. She's, she, that was a cute smile. She's like, we overcome the accuser by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And the word of our testimony does not mean. How awesome we are. The word of our testimony means how weak we are and God still advances his kingdom through our life. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for calling us to grace. Teach us, God, what it means when we raise things up to you as excuses. Teach us and show us that what we're truly saying is you're not really as big as I say you are. <sighs> Forgive us. Let your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth, and in us. We give you all the glory and the praise in your holy name. Amen. Thanks for being here today, folks.